Are you ready to turn your investments into retirement income? Listen in as Jeremy Kyle and his guests reveal ways you can make smarter retirement, investment, and tax planning decisions to achieve your ideal retirement. You will learn more about your money so you can feel better about your money and make better money decisions. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into a consistent income. And we're continuing on with the month of July as Retirement Coaching Month here. And we've got Dorian Minter. She is one of the most highly recommended retirement coaches I've come across. And Dorian, I'm, I'm glad you have you on the show. Welcome to Retirement Revealed. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Jeremy. Yeah, definitely. And we're talking about a few different things, uh, but really focusing on improving your psychological well-being in retirement. That's what we're going to call it. And I thought, who better to come on the show than someone who is a psychologist, right? You've, you've got quite a background that uh, most people don't run into. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I am a, a therapist as well as a coach, and I work really for 50 plus years in the clinical sphere and 20 years in the coaching sphere. I've always worked with people in life transitions and it sort of morphed along during my own life transitions. And I'm in my mid seventies and I got really interested in middle age, if you want to call it middle age, as I got older. And then in the whole kind of what's next retirement realm. So I'm a certified retirement coach I'm a therapist. I'm a speaker. I've co-authored a book, The Couple's Retirement Puzzle, 10 Must Have Conversations for Creating an Amazing New Life Together. And I've contributed to maybe 10 other books or so. And I've been quoted frequently. I also have a monthly audio program of my own on the fourth Tuesday of each month where I interview experts around the globe on issues about aging and retirement. What well, then? Thank you for sharing that you're in your mid seventies there because you fool me and I think you're proving it. Your level of energy uh, is just proving what I hear all the time from the experts that the more active you are, it's almost like the more active you are, the younger you are. And I think you're proving it. That's great. I think it's true. 70 is not the new 50. 70 is the new 70. And yeah. I think taking care of oneself, attitude, mindset, lifestyle choices, all of that's so important to be the best we can be as we age. For sure. And you mentioned your role as a therapist, your role as a retirement coach. Do you mind just sharing with us why would somebody, I guess, what is the difference that, between the two and mm -hmm. why would somebody maybe seek out one versus the other? Yeah, there, there's a difference between therapy and coaching, although there's some aspects of therapy that have gotten much more similar to coaching. But in general, therapy is when you're dealing with some aspects of life and you're really looking at how the past impacts your current functioning. Often when things are really intense in the present, it's partly the present and part that's being re-triggered. And so therapy in many respects, the more traditional therapy is really understanding your, your internal life. There's more solution focused therapy that is probably more similar to coaching where you're really focusing on a specific problem or issue and trying to work toward a solution. In coaching, for the most part, you're starting with now and you're looking ahead and you really only need to deal with the past if it becomes an obstacle in the moving forward. So it's a really different approach and there's a lot of goal setting, accountability, um, really thinking ahead. And many people decide they want coaching in order to plan for and prepare for retirement. And some decide they want some coaching because they've been retired and the honeymoon phase is over and it's like something's missing. So coaching can be very, very helpful to people. Sometimes people really spiral into a depression or there's a lot of anxiety and it may be that therapy is more important and helpful for them at that point in time rather than just coaching. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that part too, about anxiety, depression. You find that actually that people, when they retire, this is just kind of studies and things you find when people retire on average, they're actually happier. Like it's kind of nice not to work and things like that, but then the, it almost becomes almost two tracks where there are people who have 
continue to find purpose in retirement and they're, mm-hmm. they're the ones getting to experience the, the added happiness bonus of retirement. <laughs> and then, but there's others that go the exact opposite way. And, and thankfully there are people like you that can hopefully coach you onto the right track. And yet mm-hmm. uh, you've got this added bonus of ability here to maybe bring along people back on a track if they've, they've fallen off track there. Right. And I think it's important for people really to realize it's, it's actually a sign of strength to ask for help, whether it be in therapy or coaching. And you don't have to go through the rabbit hole of depression, but if you don't, and I think, you know, just tied in with what you were saying, Jeremy, if people don't think ahead or begin to think about what will give me some connection, engagement and purpose and meaning then you're just kind of going through the motions of being alive. And, and there can be a dark side of retirement with depression, too much drinking, drugs. So it's important to try to figure out how to embrace your life, even if you have illnesses, and, and develop an attitude and do the, really do the best you can to live as fully as you can. Yeah. And I, I like what you've done with, you, you got Basically, I'll, I'll call it a tagline. It's your website. It's revolutionizeretirement.com. Uh, you've mm-hmm. even trademarked that phrase. Oh, there, that's your, it must be your, it's a great, it's a great phrase, revolutionize retirement. And you've got things like a, a Facebook group we'll link out to that people can uh, join yeah. there. But tell us what you mean by revolutionize retirement. I think the retirement landscape has been changing and it's been changing for a while. Many people actually think the word retirement should be retired. And I kind of agree However, nobody has totally come up with a new word. So I like kind of the idea of revolutionizing. Some talk about refinement, rewiring, refiring. But the notion is that retirement, the term actually was developed, well, it was developed in Germany along in the 19th century. But in this country, back in the 30s, the concept of retirement was established. There was much more industry where you were on your feet and lifespan was shorter. And so by the time you were 62 or 65, you were pretty burnt out. And so retirement then was a destination. And often people lived five or six years after retirement. And it was back in the 30s that Social Security came around. Now with medical advances, um, people are living longer. So by the time you're 62 or 65, the quote, traditional retirement age, you might have 20, 30, 40 more years to live. And that's a long period of time. So retirement is now thought more of as a transition, a journey. And to think about what you're retiring to, you're not retiring from life. It doesn't have to be all downhill. And like any transition, there's the endings, unknown, new beginnings, and it can be a really exciting time of life. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like you said, it's, the word retirement or the concept of retirement is basically maybe 150 years old, or even in the U S just really only 90 years old, roughly Mm -hmm. because people didn't live long enough to get to retirement is work till you died. Maybe you got sick and you live with relatives to help you out. But then it got to a a point where you could have something to look forward to a a nice retirement for a few years. Well, now it's not a few years. It's, It's very possible that you could be retired longer than you are working. And that's, that's a huge amount of time. And that's why there's people like you that are focusing on what do you do in retirement? How do you make sure your, your, your sense of self, your sense of worth, your psychological well-being is going to be up in retirement. And you, you were sharing with me earlier, there's, there's really three basic areas to, to look through. There's a lot of things to look through, but you had broken them down for me on your time, your identity and your relationships. So let's go through there and see what can we be doing to improve all of those. So when you, when you told me about your time, you said uh, it's not just your, your time as in like how much time you have left, but it's what time do you spend alone? What time do you have with others? Tell us more about that. I think it really is important to think about time in a sense of, well, let, let me backtrack a moment. If you think about it, work or active parenting gives you a reason to get up in the morning. It gives you usually some structure. It gives you community. It gives you connection, engagement, purpose, and meaning. And your time with that structure is often set, although there may be some flexibility. 
but there's only a certain number of hours in the day. When you're no longer working, or if you're working in a different way, your day takes on a different flow. And it's going to be up to you if if you're not working or volunteering or playing golf or traveling, or there's some wonderful leisure pursuits you can have. But you need to think about how do you want to spend your time? And oftentimes people have a fantasy if you're in a relationship, oh, we'll do everything together. Well, you know, that may not be an expectation that your partner or spouse has. Or even if you're not in a relationship, your friends may have expectations that we're going to just do all these things. It's going to be so super fun. And it may be in some ways, but it is important to begin to think about what's your own vision? How much me time do you need? How, you know, what are the things that maybe you needed to put on the back burner because it just wasn't time because of work, because of raising children or whatever your responsibilities were? And what are some of the things you want to do now? And I do think it's really healthy not to be, feel like you have to be joined at the hip, either with a partner, spouse, or friends. And you know, figure out what are some things you want to do together? What are some things you want to do alone? Where do the entrants lie? You know, maybe there are other friends you want to do some things with. Doing some of the things separate actually can add to your friendship, if it's a friendship, or your relationship, if you're in a relationship. But it really is important to think about that time together, time alone, so you don't just constantly disappoint each other because one's expecting, oh, we're going to do everything together, and the other thinks, oh, I'm so excited to be thinking about having just time to myself. Right. I'm, I'm seeing how these aren't separate areas time, identity, relationship right. aren't separate areas at all. They're so interconnected because you've already mentioned so many different connections to relationships when we asked about time and time alone, time with others. And right. there's so many expectations that are on there uh, that others might have of you, that you might have of yourself and really thinking through what is it you want to do and then communicating and maybe having what could be a, a difficult conversation because I, I see this all the time where, uh, and, and it, this is a, a little bit of a stereotype, but it keeps happening where all of a sudden the 60 year old wife, the woman has grandkids and their kids themselves start thinking, well, she's just going to quit her job to take care of the kids. That seems to happen quite often. And whether that's something that you actually want to do going to retirement, uh, that might be different than what your, your kids are thinking you'll be doing. Or like you said, with the friends, we have people we see and know all the time that they go on vacations with friends. And one part of it is you have different levels of income that ends up happening. Mm -hmm. Your your friends from high school, everyone might have different levels of income. So if you want to go on all these vacations together, there might be conflicts over where do you go? How often do you go? And is someone able to go because they're still working and other people are retired? There's a lot of expectations that can be easily unmet unless you talk through it, which is why when we are sharing earlier about your relationships being a big key of your well-being and retirement, it's how do you have those difficult conversations? So tell us, solve it for us. How do you have difficult conversations? <laughs> well, before I jump into that, I want to just pick up on just one thing you said, if it's okay with you. Um, it That issue about the babysitting, not babysitting, or yes, what the expectations are with, with adult children, it's so important to talk about that because- you know, there really may be that expectation that you're going to, you know, be there all the time for them. And you may want to be there some of the time, but not all the time. And if you have many children, it's very interesting. The competition can start up. Oh, well, she's spending more time with your kids and not my kids. And it's very interesting how sibling rival rivalry can kind of come back in some different yeah. ways. But it doesn't end at 18, I guess. It doesn't end at 18, but it is important to have conversations. And there are ways, I mean, some conversations are just very difficult. One, um, the focus of this book I co-authored, the couple's retirement puzzle, which again, it's, you know, it says couples, but it's written for anybody because whatever, whoever is your significant other or friendships or relationships, we use the acronym BLAST, have a BLAST Hmm. when you have these conversations. And let me just kind of mention what BLAST is. So The B is blaming gets in the way. So it's very helpful 
to think about using what are called I statements. I'm thinking about, I'm wondering about, I'm curious about, to set the stage so that you're really sharing something you want to talk about or something you're feeling. It's very important to, as best you can, try to avoid you make me feel or you didn't do. Even if it's not intended, it's blaming and shaming. And if, if you feel blamed or shamed, we get defensive, we get reactive. And then if you're reactive, then I get reactive and we have this reactivity dance. So try to think about any important conversation, whether it be retirement, whatever. Think about I statements and avoid blaming statements. The L in BLAST is listen without interrupting. The interesting thing is none of us have, were are born good listeners. You know, in my field, you know, there's a lot of focus on learning how to listen. And in your field too, Jeremy, in many fields, we need to really learn to listen because what often happens is, and particularly if you've been a friend with somebody for a long time or in a long relationship, you just assume after the first few words that you know where this is going. And so it's very easy to just tune out and be thinking of your brilliant response And you may be right that this is where the conversation was going, but you could be equally wrong. And you can't know without listening and checking it out. So it does become important to take some breaths and really try to focus on listening to what you've heard without interrupting. And sometimes even just repeating back and say, I just heard you say such and such. Don't interpret it, but just, I I heard you say such and such. Is that accurate? And then you know, it's so nice to feel heard and then you can respond. So the L is listening. Do you want me to just keep going through the Let's blast? Do this. I think this is the gold. Everyone needs to hear this if they're <laughs> okay. retiring tomorrow or not. Right. I think it's for any kind of conversation, not just retirement. So even work, kids, whomever. So the A is appreciate what you're hearing, even if you don't agree. And you may want to agree to disagree. The A is also that, agree to disagree, and don't make assumptions. I always say assumptions get people into hot water. But the appreciating what you hear, even if you don't agree, I can give just a little example. I remember a long time ago at a workshop that I ran, somebody, and there happened to be couples at this particular workshop, and they were doing some of the exercises. And a woman came up to me and she said, you know, I've never asked my husband why such and such was so important to him. And now that I understand it and appreciate it, I want to try to help make it happen. And it goes a long way. And agreeing, if it's a really difficult one, it is important to agree to disagree. In many relationships, couples, friendships, there can be these polar positions, my way versus your way, win versus lose. It's helpful to think win-win, which is sometimes your way, sometimes mine. It may not balance out one for one, but you know, it's important to sort of appreciate and hear and respect each other. It goes a long way. Um, The S stands for set a safe space to talk, particularly if you're not used to talking about, you know, important, difficult conversations. For some people, it's walking. For some, it might be in the car. But if if you know it's going to be heated, I would suggest avoiding the car. For some, it can be at home over dinner or in a restaurant. I mean, now with covid I mean, some people are going back into restaurants now, so, but some people aren't. Um, but set a safe space and also set a time limit. Because if you're not used to talking about difficult things, you might start out with the I statement, like, I really want to talk about, you know, my wish to stop working pretty soon. Set 10 minutes up. Say, I just want to talk for maybe 10 minutes tonight. Does that work for you? And try to give the person a little control over kind of when the conversation will be. The beauty of relationships and friendships is that you can come back to it. And if you're not used to talking about difficult stuff or starts getting heated, take a time out. You know, we do often for kids, you know, just take a time out, think about it, and then come back to it. So set a safe space, set a time limit. And then the T is talk without distractions. So when you're going to be talking for however many minutes you're going to talk, turn off the phone, turn off the computer, be focused in the present. 
I, I think if you kind of can think about this framework of having a blast, it may help you. I mean, it doesn't need, mean you're going to quickly come to a resolution, but it may help the beginning of the process of hearing and understanding and figuring out ways maybe to problem solve or compromise, you know, and to see where it can lead you. It's Jeremy Kyle here, and I know you're listening to the Retirement Reveal Podcast because you want to learn more about making great retirement decisions. I've created a free video course for you to do just that. Head over to 5stepretirementplan.com and sign up to receive this video training right in your email inbox. We broke down our 5-step retirement plan into bite-sized videos so you can get started on the retirement, investment, and tax planning you need to create a consistent retirement income. Go to 5stepretirementplan.com. Use the number or spell it out. You'll get there either way. 5stepretirementplan.com. Thanks for listening. And now for the rest of the show. That's great. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. So blast. I haven't heard that before. I'm, I'm guessing my wife's heard of that. She's an elementary school counselor. So I got to get more uh, information on, on how to have a blast of conversations. That's, that's great. Well, good. So now that we've talked about the relationships part of it, actually, before we get there, you had mentioned, I think is you might have a guidebook or a, a blog you've written about, it's called planning for the what ifs, talking with others about end of life wishes. Cause that's a, that's a right. big conversation that you need to have with, with your relationships, perhaps your spouse, probably your kids for sure. What, how would we go about doing that? That that's something people don't want to talk about, but really you're better off talking about it before the end of life instead of after the end of life. And actually it's really important and helpful to talk about it when you're well and healthy. I know often people don't want to have to think ahead. You know, it's like, who wants to think about when I'm maybe disabled or while I'm dying, but it is, it's an act of love, actually, to survivors to have this conversation. I actually learned it in my own family way back 35 years ago when my father was sick and dying. And it was really interesting. My, they lived in the West Coast. My brother and I different different places on the East Coast. And we were out visiting. And my father said, we need to talk about this. And my brother said, no, we don't. And I said, yes, we do. And it was so helpful to really know how he defined quality of life, what he wanted, what he didn't want, what the, where a list of all the passwords were for all of his digital life. Even 35 years ago, there was some digital life and password for all of the accounts that he had, um, of which there were many. He believed diversification meant many, 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 many accounts. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it was so helpful and it led to conversation with my mother. So when, it, you know, I, I was her healthcare proxy and was able to help her deal at the end the way she wanted. It is an act of love. And so I really do recommend that sooner than later. And it's such a relief once you've been able to talk about it. There's online, you can find, I think it's called Death with Dignity. Um, which is a list of kind of questions to think about. Most states now, you know, have their lists of what things are helpful and important to talk about. And before you go into the hospital, you have to sign all these things about, do you want, what do you want in terms of end of life issues and wishes? So it's important and it's important to think it through. Um, And in addition, you know, to have it written down, I think it's it's so important. And there is something called the Conversation Project, which Ellen Goodman, who's a, um, she was a journalist and won Pulitzer Prize here in the Boston area you know, where I live. When her mother was dying, she realized people weren't talking. And so the Conversation Project will provide a free kind of starter kit with some videos on how to have some of these difficult conversations. Because what's interesting is sometimes the parent doesn't want to have it, or you as the parent doesn't want to have it. And sometimes your kids don't want to have it with you. Um, So, you know, the resistance can come on either side. But again, just to underscore, there is such a relief if you allow yourself to talk it through and, and, and know that it needs to be changed periodically because your attitudes might change and you may not want to blanket. Uh, do not resuscitate. Um, a bioethic 
a bio, I can say this word right, a bioethicist that years ago I interviewed in my program gave a, a really illuminating story of somebody who had said, absolutely do not resuscitate. And, um, but had the person been willing, just a little bit of intervention would have helped because there was a treatment that would have enabled the person to have some aspect of life he wanted. So I do want to encourage people to just think about it seriously and, and, and revise it as you get older, because your situation may change. And many people, since we're living longer, live with terminal illnesses, chronic illnesses, multiple chronic illnesses. But it is an act of love, and it's so liberating to talk about it. I know my husband and I have, and you know, our, our son knows sort of what our wishes are. And he has written one too. Um, and, you know, he has a health, I mean, we're his healthcare proxy now. And, but it, it's really a nice exercise. It's not morbid at all. A nice exercise of thinking about what is quality of life for you. Right. And thank you for sharing that research. I have not come across it before, but I looked it mm. up. I believe it's the conversation project.org. Is that the right yeah, one for you? That's the, that's the right one. Yeah. Okay. We'll link to that, the conversation project.org. And people are probably thinking, Oh, what's the best age to do that? I'm guessing you're going to say right now is the best age to do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You answer and, it yourself right now. Yeah. And I, I know people at all ages, I've, I've known people in their twenties have strokes. I've yeah. known people that, um, they're looking forward to retirement and they have a heart attack and die before they hit retirement. You can't wait till a certain age to exactly. have these conversations and, and appreciate yeah. you sharing that and why it's so important and a, a good conversation starter with the conversation project.org. That's good. Well, let's, the other let's thing, finish. I just what? want to add one more piece if it's okay. Sometimes we really don't recognize that we have both a real world and a digital world. The worst thing that can happen is if something happens to you suddenly and nobody knows where the accounts are, or who the key people are, or what the passwords are. There are too many times that it's happened with, you know, you think back to 9-11 or, you know, all the, all the stuff that's going on. It's very important to keep an updated list of those things and make sure somebody knows where that list is or where the keys are, where the car title is, what the passwords are. It's at a time of crisis, if somebody's ill and, and not able to take care of things or has died to add to that crisis of not knowing how to take care of any of the, any of the situation just can totally put somebody over the edge. And it just, it just exacerbates the crisis. So it's so important to do that and keep it caught up. And if, if everything's on your phone, make sure somebody or other knows what your password for your phone is. Mm -hmm. And it's also pretty helpful to have it written down somewhere because um, phones can crash and I mean, maybe it's up in the cloud somewhere, but somebody mm -hmm. still has to have access to it. So it's just part of the things to think about. Yeah, for sure. And let, I want to finish on the third piece you talked about with the, your identity and how you can use your identity to improve your retirement. And really, well, I guess, tell me more about that. And we're going to tease a bit about, you mentioned about valuing yourself as an elder. So, so tell us a bit about your identity and uh, how you approach that in retirement. Okay. So if you think about it, and again, I don't know what the age you know, is of your listeners, but as we get older, it's not unusual at different points in life to just say, who am I? Or if you're in a relationship, you sort of say, who are you? you know, or who are we? And if a lot of your life was working. It's like, who am I if I'm not working? Who am I without my CV? Or, and, or if a lot of your identity has been being a parent, who am I if I'm not a parent? Now, it is true that as a parent, you're always a parent, but I distinguish between active parenting and parenting of, of adult, potentially adult children mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. grandparent and all. And there are these midlife shifts that happen. Some people it can start around age 40, although midlife now with the extended lifespan is considered to be more like 50 to 75 is sort of mid-age because people are living into their 80s, 90s, many into their hundreds. I think also what begins to shift is sometimes our definition of success begins to shift. I mean, I don't know that any of us are ever free from feeling like we're going to get evaluated. But I think as we get older, 
often more comes from inside. You sort of know what feels good and feels right and if you've done okay or not done okay. And, and I think it's important to recognize that and trust it. And in the same way, you know, some people, I mean, a lot of people struggle with how do I want to be referred to? Am I a senior? Am I an elder? I'm not elderly, but you know, I'm older. There's, there is a new identity that you were mentioning, Jeremy, that I think is helpful for people to think about, which is think about a new identity and becoming an elder. You know, there is something wonderful if you can allow yourself to feel the, the gratitude of the, you know, being able to be an elder and live longer. You've got a lot of perspective and wisdom, and it's wonderful to be able to share that but also know there's a lot to still learn from people of other ages, from younger people. There's an organization that I, I think is wonderful. It's called SAGING, S-A-G-E hyphen I-N-G International. And it's actually free to join, although they do ask for donations. They have some really great programs and they have opportunities also for people, you know, if you are at the stage where you want to start giving back. There are groups that you can join and, and not feel alone in wanting to sort of do something for the world, for the planet, depending on whatever your, you know, your approach is and what's important to you. And it is helpful to think about yourself as an elder. I, I do think it's a wonderful new identity to not be ashamed of or embarrassed of, that you have a wisdom and perspective Share your stories. People love your stories, but listen to other people's stories. You know, it's wonderful, you know, if, if you are blessed and have grandchildren or nieces or nephews or even just kids of friends, ask them to interview you or interview them or, you know, have, begin to develop maybe a video history or an oral history. Telling stories helps us appreciate the richness of our lives. And I think attitude and mindset and, and feeling gratitude of being alive, forgiving ourselves. We all make mistakes. So forgiving ourselves, being able to forgive others as, it, as, as you're able to, all helps us kind of live our best life. And hopefully, whenever the end is, not have a whole lot of regrets. So I'm, I'm a real believer of being present, being focused, and, and connecting. And, and this new identity of an elder is is one way of doing it. I mean, value yourself, reflect on what are some things that, that you've done really well? What are things you're proud of? What are some things that you know, maybe you wished were different? I mean, we can't change events in the past, but we can change the story we tell ourselves. We can change the meaning we give to it. And so there's a lot of, of helpful things that can happen as we get older, if we allow ourselves to reflect, have life review, and think about harvesting, in our sense, harvesting our wisdom. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, especially the, the Saging website. We're going to give that to there. That I found it, it says, from going from aging to Saging. Mm -hmm. I guess it's more of a, some people are focused on the older part of older and wiser. And it's good not to forget the, the wiser part, maybe focus on the wiser exactly. part. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And you said mm -hmm. that right at the beginning, you said uh, some people say 70 is the new 50, but 70 is the new 70. Like right. stop reliving your fifties or thirties or stop wishing you were younger. Just embrace right. who you are and what you've become. And that's a, a great thing. Although thank you for also saying that middle age uh, doesn't start till 50. My wife's turning 40 now uh, this year. And so I'll let her know that she's got 10 more years of uh, right. not yet being a middle age. So, right. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thing. So well, many shifts. No, you're, you're just right on so many shifts of, uh, and it's because we're living longer, you know, if you, uh, if you live till 65 and retire till you're 80, well, that's a different lifestyle than if you worked into your seventies and lived to your hundred. And that's more of a reality. Uh, what I see when it comes to planning, uh, whether it's financial or, you know, in this case, the psychological well being, a lot of people still have the old assumptions like, Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm 60, I'm going to retire and I'm going to die in 10 years. Like that's, right. Right. how do you feel when you're 70 and you didn't die? You know? Yeah. <laughs> right. You, well, you and know? that, yeah, no, that's such an important point, Jeremy. And there's, there is age of, ageism in our society, and there's something that's called internalized ageism, yes. where you, know, you, you think of an age, a number, and it's like, I'm old, or just sort of like what you were saying. And it's you know, and, and this belief that it's all downhill. 
And it will be if you believe it. But if you, you know, I mean, you can't do the same things necessarily when you're 70 that you could when you were 50 in terms of like how you work out or, you know, maybe you have to change some of your dreams. You can't deal with altitude in the same way. So you, you know, you find places to hike where there aren't mountains. Or, you know, I mean, you do have to change your dreams, but you still can have dreams. And I think it's so important to keep that in mind. An attitude, um, Becca Levy, who's a psychologist, I think she's a psychologist and also in public health at Yale University, talks about her research has been on attitude and mindset. And people who have a more positive attitude about aging actually have been found to live like seven and a half years longer. Mm. So your attitude makes such a big difference. And you know, by the time you're 65, Research says that 30% is genetics, and that's big if you've got a lot of genetic stuff, but mm -hmm. 70% are things you can have some control over, like nutrition, exercising your body and brain, spirituality, meaningful relationships, this connection, engagement, purpose, and meaning, which is the foundation of well-being. All of these are, you know, you can have some control over. I mean, we can't we don't have total control. There's a lot we can't control. So it's important to try to control the parts you can. Yeah, that's, that's right on. I think uh, there, there's your therapy background of the, I think it's called the locus <laughs> control. Right. Uh, exactly. We see this all the time that um, control what you can control and protect what you cannot control. And people, sometimes they get it wrong and they wonder what's, what's going on because they're trying to control <laughs> the stock market. They're trying to control right. all kinds of things they have zero control over. You'll probably have a, a much better, um, go of things if you control the things you can't control. So I appreciate you saying yeah. that because we talk about that a lot too. Great. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on uh, the show, Dorian. You do uh, such great work. You have so many resources and things for people out there. What's, what's the best place for people to go to, to learn more about you and all the great work you're doing? Go to my website, which is www.revolutionizeretirement.com. You'll learn about my programs, about the coaching. I have this fourth Tuesday program that I mentioned at the beginning. Sign up always begins the week before at my website. If you sign up, even if you can't be there live, you'll get a recording link after the call. And it's audio only. It's not video. And it's a chance. I, this is my 10th year anniversary. And so at the beginning of this year, I began making available past interviews as weekly podcasts. So you can even follow in their weekly podcasts. And on my website also, there's a, a takeaway, a giveaway of a book with some resources. And it's, I'm in the process of updating it because it's from about a year and a half ago, but it's still got some wonderful resources. And pretty soon it will be updated with a lot of the new books that have come out 2021 and 2022. So go to my website and that's a way that you can be in touch with me and you can reach me. My email is Dorian at DorianMincer.com or through the website, there's a, a place that you can send messages to. Wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing all those resources. I'll always get in touch with you. We'll have that in the show notes, uh, but thank you, Dorian, for, for coming on the show. Thank you. It's been a delight. Thanks for inviting me, Jeremy, and you're doing such good work with the people that you work with. And, and there are so many parallels. I mean, I, I didn't really mention, but you know, with this idea of puzzle pieces, I think finances and health and wellness impact so many choices we have in terms of where we live, how we want our money to work for you. So I think, I, I, I believe no matter how much money you have, it's important to work with a financial person to help you figure out how you want your money to work for you. I'll give a little plug for you there. There you go. I'll take it. <laughs> well, I appreciate you mentioning the, the puzzle idea because uh, you had said earlier to me that unlike a jigsaw puzzle that fits together perfectly, uh, there's all kinds of different pieces of the puzzle. Each one's different sizes, shapes. They don't, they might not, they probably won't fit together perfectly. Uh, but so importantly is your finances, your health and wellness, those influence so many other parts of the puzzle. So definitely starting there with your, your finances, your, your health and wellness, and remembering the wellness part is your right. well-being as well, well too. Absolutely. Yeah. Very important. Awesome. Well, the, thank you, Doreen, for coming on the show. And thank you for listening to the Retirement Reveal Podcast. We believe if you know more about your money, you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions. 
Thank you for listening to the Retirement Revealed podcast. Click on the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit retirement-revealed.com to learn more. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Kyle Financial Partners. Kyle Financial Partners does not provide legal, accounting, or tax advice. Consult your attorney or tax professional. Representatives have general knowledge of the Social Security tenants. For complete details on your situation, contact the Social Security Administration. Kyle Financial Partners is a part of the Thrivent Advisor Network, a registered investment advisor. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.